Order, and the sitting is resumed. It's time for questions to the Minister of Justice, and we will start with listed questions. And I call Mr. Mickey Brady. Mickey Brady. Question one. Principal Deputy Speaker, I am personally overseeing an ambitious and far-reaching programme of work to transform the performance of the system. This includes a range of procedural, legislative and structural reforms, which in some cases represent a fundamental shift in the operation of our system. My officials have been reporting progress to the Justice Committee every six months. While some improvements have been made, I am clear that we need to go further. The Draft Justice Bill, which I propose to bring forward in the first half of this year, will include provisions to reform the committal process, to encourage earlier guilty pleas, to introduce prosecutorial fines as an alternative to court, to introduce new statutory rules around how cases must be managed, and to reform the summons process. We are also working with justice partners to improve the timeliness of forensic evidence, to make better use of live links, and to expedite those cases where there is likely to be a guilty plea. Finally, I have given particular focus to cases involving young people. I am currently consulting on the introduction of statutory time limits to the youth court and on an equality impact assessment of youth engagement clinics, a new process to support young people to make better informed and earlier decisions about their cases. This is a difficult and complex problem, but given the commitment of senior leaders in the criminal justice agencies, I am confident that we will succeed in delivering a faster, fairer justice system. Thank you, and I call Mickey Brady for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Given the latest findings into delays in court proceedings, does the Minister agree that continuing unacceptable delays undermines confidence in the judicial system delivering faster, fairer justice? Well, I certainly agree with Mr Brady that there are concerns that if we are failing to deliver justice fastly and efficiently, there are dangers to the justice system. That's why we're looking at that whole issue of things like committal reform, summons reform, statutory case management, where the Lord Chief Justice has given a particular lead to his colleagues, um, and measures to encourage earlier guilty pleas where guilty pleas will be coming forward anyway. I believe that those measures, as indeed the allocation of an additional, additional judge to the Belfast Crown Court, has seen significant progress in cases being put through that court, and all of that, I believe, is enhancing confidence in the system. Thank you, and I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank the Minister for that update. Uh, there is an allegation, obviously, that there is a piecemeal system regarding efficiencies and particularly targeting financial savings. Can the Minister point to any specifics where there have been uh, real financial savings and efficiency savings? Well, I thank Mr Elliott for the question, Principal Deputy Speaker. I think the, the answers which I've just given to Mr Brady, giving the detail of some of the work that's being done, is all about enhancing efficiency, improving the speed with which things go through the system, and thereby ensuring that we get the best possible value for money. If he's hinting at the issues of the cost of legal aid, that is an issue which also has to be addressed, but it's not the sole way by, by which we're seeking to reform the system. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I uh, thank the Minister for his answers um, and agree with the Minister that there is a real need to manage the whole system in a more efficient and effective manner. Would the Minister not agree with me that statutory time limits are, are desirable to try and bring about that better management of the system? Well, yes, I thank Mr McGuinness for that point and agree entirely that statutory time limits are uh, important. And I believe it's in fact the case that the consultation on statutory time limits for the Youth Court is already encouraging and enhancing the progress which was underway. Uh, there is no doubt that we could not have introduced statutory time limits at a very early stage because there was a danger that we could have not lived up to them. But I do believe as part of the reform package, they underpin the good work which is being done by a number of different agencies across the system. Thank you. And I call Mr. Robin Newton. Question number two, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Principal Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will take questions two and ten together. Acts of animal cruelty, such as those witnessed recently in East Belfast, are abhorrent and to be utterly condemned. There is no justification for this sort of appalling treatment of any animals. Animal cruelty and welfare are the policy responsibility of the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. My role as Justice Minister is to ensure that proposals for offences and penalties from any minister or any department sit comfortably within our legislative framework. 
The Welfare of Animals Act Northern Ireland 2011 was brought before the Assembly by the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. I agree that the offences and penalties that the Act created are appropriate within the framework of criminal law. The Act increased the maximum penalty for offences relating to breaches of animal welfare. In the Crown Court, for the most serious offences, the maximum penalty is two years imprisonment, an unlimited fine or both. In the Magistrates' Court, the maximum penalty is six months' imprisonment, a fine of up to £5,000 or both. The Act also provides for the disqualification of people from owning or keeping animals. Under the previous legislation, for the last five years for which figures are available, 90 people were convicted of various offences, in some cases leading to custodial sentences. In the first two years of the new legislation, initial figures indicate that there have been 34 convictions for causing unnecessary suffering to animals or animal fighting and 49 disqualifications from keeping animals. Prosecution and sentencing in individual cases are of course matters for the independent prosecuting authorities and judiciary. I know, however, that sentencing guidelines for the 2011 Act have been produced for the Magistrates' Court in accordance with the Lord Chief Justice's programme for action. I call Mr Newton for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for, for his answer uh, so far. Uh, Minister, I, I think it is, it is widespread in our society that those who witness many of the horrific crimes in either the media, uh, the print, or, or, or hear about them, are concerned at the very few convictions that happen, uh, 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 and indeed the sentences that are uh, uh, put out for those who create the most heinous of crimes. Society demands more than, than what virtually amounts to knocks, on, knocks on, on a slap on the wrist. Why are we not getting the type of response that society is demanding? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, whilst I agree with the general thrust of what Mr Newton is saying, I, I fear I need to be careful to not stray into discussing sentencing in individual cases. Uh, as I understand it, in the previous five years, uh, or in the five years of the previous legislation, before the current legislation was introduced, there were six custodial sentences amongst those 90 convicted. In the last two years, uh, there have been, there's only been one custodial sentence for the 34 convictions. It is, as I said in my principal answer, an issue which is being addressed by the Lord Chief Justice in terms of his sentencing guidelines, but individual cases must remain the responsibility of individual members of the judiciary, though I have absolutely no doubt that there is widespread concern at the level of animal cruelty which exists on the part of small numbers of people in this society and the concern that that should be seen uh, followed by very significant sentencing. And, uh, could I ask members in coming, to, especially at supplementary questions, to come to their question as quickly as possible? I call Ms. Pam Cameron here. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. He'll, he'll be aware of the recent events in Antrim uh, around Mastering Golf Club where the swarm was found, uh, which is quite distressing to most to hear. Um, of, and, and, and I know we will agree that the, we now have very good legislation in place as of 2011 to deal with animal cruelty. Um, but, Minister, is this meaningless without the adequate staff in place to um, actually enforce the legislation? Well, I suppose the issue is not only the relevant staff in place um, in terms of police to carry out investigations, but also the issue of information being supplied by any member of the public who can assist. And I certainly would agree with my constituency colleague about the horrendous nature of that particular offence in Antrim uh, and say that if there is anybody who has any information on any offence such as that, they have a duty to report it because criminal offences are the responsibility of all of us who have information to report and to assist the police and the prosecution service. I call Ms. Rosalind McCarley. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, can I ask the Minister what preventative measures can be taken to eliminate or deal with the types of um, obscene cruelty that were recently highlighted in the media? Well, again, whilst I agree that Ms Macaulay has a point, I fear I would be straying on the territory of the Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development if I were to go too far into that. I think there is clearly an issue of education. There is an issue of ensuring that the widespread public abhorrence is carried through to those small numbers of people who would carry out such acts, and that is in part done by those who are willing to provide information 
to assist the police and, for example, the USPCA in following through on potential reports of cruelty. Uh, and it is an issue which, however, in policy terms, lies with her uh, party colleague. And I'm very happy to see that the justice agencies cooperate with DARD on anything which is relevant for us. Thank you. And I call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, animal cruel investigations uh, generally are, are find a large number being reported, but yet a low level of prosecution. So can the Minister advise how has he networked with the other members of the Justice family and with other rel relevant agencies to ensure that animal cruelty issues are given the significant uh, interest and efforts that should be required? Well, I'm sure Mr. Beggs is aware that there is the specific unit within the PSNI responsible for um, animal and wildlife crime issues. It is, of course, also a matter for all uh, neighbourhood policing. Um, but it is an issue not just of the justice agencies joining together, but the responsibilities which lie with local councils um, in terms of pets in particular, the responsibilities which lie with DARD in terms of farm animals, the wider policy responsibility with DARD. There is a need for a significant joining up. And there's also the issue that it may well be seen to be appropriate at a local level, for example, by PCSPs, if they believe they have a particular problem in their area. So, as ever, it's an issue of partnership of a variety of agencies and the wider community. Thank you. And I call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Obviously, sentencing can only occur where uh, perpetrators are caught. What is being done to um, improve the rates of detection? Because given what's been reported in the media is merely the tip of the iceberg. Well, I can only but repeat to Mr. Agnew the points I've just made, that there clearly are issues which are widespread across a number of different agencies. But as in, in the case of any offence, the key issue is to ensure that information is provided to the police or to local councils or DARD where appropriate. And that is the best way in which we will deal with these issues at the same time as we address the widespread issue of education. But it is not simply a matter that the police can carry out on their own. It is a matter which really does require that joined up approach and a recognition which was exacerbated, I think, in the minds of many people by, the, uh, by what we saw on television last week of the horrendous nature of some of this cruelty and the important issue of taking action against it. Thank you. And I call Ms. Carolyn McEvitt. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, uh, question three. Principal Deputy Speaker, a range of measures are in place to prevent illicit drugs coming into prison, including the use of passive drugs dogs, regular cell searches, visitor and staff searches, and mandatory drugs testing. At all three prisons, revised intelligence-led searching strategies have also been developed to improve performance. The vigilance of staff is also a key factor in the discovery of illicit drugs. Recently, this vigilance resulted in the life of a prisoner who had taken the drugs being saved. Anyone found in possession of or testing positive for illicit drugs will be considered for referral to the police and subject to prison disciplinary action. The prison service also continues to work in close partnership with the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust, which has lead responsibility in relation to the de delivery of health care in prisons, to minimise abuse of drugs, and to educate and support those prisoners who have addiction issues. The Trust ensures that relevant and robust measures are in place in relation to the management of in-possession medication and support is in place through alcohol and drug treatment, counselling services, multidisciplinary case reviews and drug awareness sessions. A joint initiative involving the prison service, the police service and other partners to reduce the drug supply and demand within Magabri prison is underway. Already during this initiative there have been 98 drug seizures, seven visitors have been arrested and 51 cases are being investigated by police with a view to prosecution. The prison service will continue to work closely with the police to share and act on intelligence relating to drugs. And I call Karen McEvitt for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, can the Minister indicate what uh, class of drugs have been found in the last six months uh, within the prison system? Uh, I think the simple answer to Ms. McEvitt's question is almost every class of drugs, and that has included, unfortunately, the, the possession of uh, properly issued medication in the possession of prisoners you know, who do not have right to that. Uh, that's one, one of the other issues which needs to be addressed, where, for example, the, the South Eastern Trust is looking at issues of supervised swallow for some of the particularly uh, dangerous medication to ensure that it doesn't become traded within the prison. But other than that, we see a variety of different drugs being smuggled into prison and attempts to smuggle them in. Thank you. And I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Thank you, 
very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his, his, his answers in relation to this question. Whereas rightly there, there can be an emphasis placed on what people call illicit drugs, we all know that there is a high number of, of prisoners dependent on prescription drugs. Can the Minister outline some of the programmes that are in place to deal with them and how, how success is measured in relation to that? Well, I thank Mr McCartney. As I just said to Mr McEvitt, I mean, the, the key issue is to ensure that where prescription medication is supplied, it is supplied and used by the individual to whom it's supplied. That's why where there are particular concerns about, I think it's the six most tradable drugs that they are largely dealt with by supervised swallow to ensure that vulnerable prisoners are not put under pressure to trade them. Uh, at the same time, there are wider issues of education, but those are all principally the responsibility of the South Eastern Trust rather than of the prison service in terms of their health care dealings. Uh, obviously, prison staff have support roles for that uh, in supporting the work being done by the trust staff. Thank you. And I call Mr. William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. The Minister will know that I wrote to him recently around this issue, and he came back with statistics pointing out that a project started on the 7th of October last year, seeing that 53 drug seizures had happened in Magabre. Six visitors to the prison have been arrested uh, with, with in possession of drugs, and 40 prisoners currently being investigated uh, for drugs offences. Can I ask the Minister, uh, well, in welcoming this proactive action being taken and this initiative being in place, can he assure this House that this initiative will be rolled out across the prison estate in Northern Ireland? Well, I didn't quite catch the numbers which Mr Humphrey gave. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think I've actually um, updated the numbers in my, in my main answer. Uh, but uh, the key issue on that is, given that this was started as a pilot project in McGabry, the scale of seizures, the number of people who were intercepted, uh, has meant that we have decided to continue that process within McGabry. Obviously, there is an issue further to look at the other two prisons after that, but it certainly was an issue which was not for a pilot project to be run for a short period of time and then stopped. Work is continuing in McGabry, and we will review how it then applies to the other two institutions. Thank you, and I call Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I would thank the Minister for his responses on the subject concerns all of us. Minister, what, what steps have been taken to ensure that contact between prisoners and visitors will not, be, will not facilitate the actual exchange of these illicit drugs? Well, Mr. Cree highlights correctly that in many cases we're talking about visitors who attempt to smuggle drugs in. Uh, that's why uh, visitors are uh, subjected to, for example, the, the passive drug dog search as they, uh, as they go into the prison, although we accept that that is not 100 per cent guaranteed. Uh, Clearly, the great majority of visits take place in open, open circumstances, but under a degree of supervision. Where there are specific concerns, visits happen on a closed basis where there is no physical contact between individuals, and all of that is done on the basis of an intelligence-led process. The reality is we have actually seen more seizures with fewer searches in recent months because of the use of that intelligence-led process rather than the blanket process, and I believe that that is part of the lesson which needs to be learned. Thank you. And I call Mr. Oliver McMullen. Mr. Oliver question four. In Northern Ireland, as in other jurisdictions, there is no specific offence of rural crime or agricultural crime under criminal law. Conviction data is recorded for generic offences such as theft, robbery or criminal damage. It is not currently possible from the data to identify if, con if a conviction relates to rural or agricultural related crime. However, reducing opportunities to commit crime and make rural communities safer is a key strand of the community safety strategy. A business and rural crime action plan is in place, a key outcome of which was the establishment of the Rural Crime Unit. This initiative is supported by my department, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, the NFU Mutual Insurance Society, and the Police Service of Northern Ireland. The unit provides a dedicated resource to identify trends and patterns in agri-crime in order to assist the targeting of resources and initiatives accordingly. The outcome of this work was recently evidenced when the Agriculture Minister Michelle O'Neill and I announced a funding package to encourage farmers in theft hotspots to fit security devices to their machinery. At a local level, policing and community safety partnerships have also developed action plans to address local community concerns, which include the development of tailored solutions to address rural crime. Thank you, Mr. McMullen, for supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer, but does the Minister accept criticism that between the police service and his own department, 
insufficient resources are being allocated to tackle this problem. And a recent case in point being that of a county Armagh farmer who was forced to undertake his own investigations in order to recover a stolen farmyard machinery. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I think most members would know that if I started to stray into the discussion of operational issues concerning one particular crime, I really would be treading on the Chief Constable's footsteps. The issue of resourcing is an issue for the Chief Constable. The deployment of those resources in individual districts is responsible to the District Commander. None of that issue about the deployment of resources is for the Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Given Minister cooperation with DARD in terms of their involvement in the Rural Crime Unit and also the, their particular animal and public health information system, what improvement has there been in terms of the detection rates of those responsible for livestock thefts? Well, I thank Mr Rogers for his question. Unfortunately, I don't have the specific information on livestock thefts at this point. Certainly, the, the Rural Crime Unit's target is to see a reduction of 3% in the first year of operation in terms of agri-crime generally. Uh, PSNI Statistics Branch is working on developing the necessary uh, figures to uh, distinguish between rural uh, crime and specific agricultural crime, particularly looking at things like livestock as well as the machinery thefts which have exercised a number of people recently. And I hope we will see when we get that data through better that the work of the data analyst in the Rural Crime Unit will enable us to measure in coming years how that thing works. I call Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. I wonder, can the Minister uh, let us know if he's satisfied with the investigative procedure and related outcomes of agricultural related crime? <coughs> Well, I think the answer to that, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, is that, like Mrs. Overend and I suspect everybody else in this chamber, until crime is reduced to zero, we will never be satisfied. But as to give a specific assessment uh, on how the police are dealing with it is, as I said to Mr. McMullen, beyond my remit or my role as Minister. Thank you. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five to the Minister. The main implication of not dealing with the past is that we retain the status quo with a number of bodies across the justice system, the police service, the HET, the police ombudsman and the coroner's service dealing with troubles related cases. The individual bodies or the system as a whole are often the subject of criticism. I can assure members that my department and the criminal justice bodies take seriously their responsibilities in relation to the past and continue to dedicate significant resources to dealing with it. However, it is becoming increasingly clear that the status quo is not sustainable. The needs and expectations of victims and their families are not always being met. The Criminal Justice Inspection estimates that costs will exceed £187 million over the next five years and set out in its recent report the impact that dealing with the past has on the justice system and its capacity to deliver an effective present-day service. More broadly, the toxic legacy of our past continues to hamper our work to build confidence and foster improved community relations in interface areas, and the PSNI continues to devote significant resource to dealing with public order issues resulting from parades, flags, and related protests. We simply cannot afford not to deal with our past. It is clear that we need a more encompassing and strategic approach to dealing with the past across justice and across wider government and society. McCarthy for a uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I very much welcome the response from the, the Minister. But would he agree with me that um, the victims, the needs and uh, truth and justice for victims is a priority and indeed a legal and moral oblig obligation by any state, and in particular the Northern Ireland Executive, to seek uh, justice uh, and truth for the victims right across Northern Ireland? Well, I certainly agree with Mr. McCarthy. Of course, we know that for some people it would not be possible to have both justice and truth. That's why I believe that the proposals which emerged during the talks chaired by Dr. Richard Haas for the establishment of both the Historical in Investigations Unit and the Independent Commission for Information Retrieval provide the opportunity that where possible justice is obtained and where that is not possible and victims wish it, information is, is obtained which will give them some measure of comfort. But those are key issues which are currently before the five party leaders in talks, I believe that there is a vital necessity on moral grounds to deal with those issues of the past, to meet the needs and the concerns of victims, and to ensure that we are able to deal with that in an inclusive way 
and have the criminal justice system able to operate for the needs of today. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Lynch. I'll get the pre last and call you. Um, will the Minister agree with me that the Haas proposals in their final form should be implemented? Thank you. Well, I, I fear I am straying slightly into um, the partisan role, but certainly as far as those elements of the past which fall to the Department of Justice are concerned, I believe that the proposals in the final document from Dr. Haas are very close to what is required and I am certainly committed to ensuring that the Department of Justice plays its part, both in the interest of ensuring the system works properly and the moral issues which I've just highlighted in my reply to Mr. McCarthy. Ms. Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister uh, alluded to the cost of uh, dealing with the past, and given the British Secretary of State's recent comments uh, in Westminster in relation to no additional money being uh, given uh, to that. Has the Minister uh, made any representation uh, to the Secretary of State and to the British Government in relation to their responsibilities in dealing with the past and actually assisting with the cost of dealing with the past? Well, I thank Mrs Kelly for that fairly pertinent question. I'm not sure that the Minister of Justice has ever made any case uh, to the Secretary of State for the need uh, for the British Government to supply any funding towards dealing with the past. The leader of the Alliance Party most certainly has. If we proceed through to establish the institutions recommended by the Haas report or close to those recommended by the Haas report, then as Minister of Justice, I believe it will be important that indeed both governments, the British government and the Irish government, but principally the British government, step up to their responsibilities for dealing with the past and help, help not exclusively pay, but help with the funding for that to enable the budget that the DOJ has to deal with the issues of the present, whilst the past is dealt with in a more comprehensive way. I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you uh, very much indeed. Just to follow on from uh, Mrs. Kelly's question uh, to the Minister, and indeed as response to Mr. Lynch, where he said that the Haas 7 proposals for dealing with the past are close to what is required, uh, what are the cost implications for his department? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, the department has not done an assessment as to what the cost implications would be. But what is it? Uh, because we do not have the full worked out arrangements agreed by the five parties to know what it is possible to implement. What is absolutely clear is that there are very significant costs for the past falling on the Department of Justice at present, which are creating a very significant burden on the institutions of the justice system dealing with the needs of the present. That is why it's so vital that we deal with the past on economic grounds at the same time as we deal with the past on moral grounds. And I call Mr Barry McElduff. Uh, Kesh Devereshe, question number six. Principal Deputy Speaker, when I accepted the large majority of the recommendations in the Youth Justice Review Report in October of 2012, I published an implementation plan setting out how they would be, how they would be taken forward. Updates to this plan were issued in January and June of 2013. A further update is now due and will be published shortly. It will be made available on the Department's website. Successes have included the rollout of police discretion, which has helped to deliver on the recommendation around a proportionate response to low-level offending by children that does not necessarily invoke the weight of the justice system, a renewed focus on efficiency and more appropriate outcomes with the proposed introduction of statutory time limits and the piloting of youth engagement clinics, the removal of under 18-year-olds from prison custody, and a public consultation on custody arrangements for children to inform the development of the necessary legislative changes to underpin this position, enhanced communication with children through the development by the Public Prosecution Service of new letter templates, and revised guidelines for the operation of the Youth Court. Those are all now in place. The review has therefore provided a coherent agenda to assist in the reform of our youth justice system, and I'm committed to seeing it through. I call Mr. Barry McElduff. Uh, Colonel, got, uh, Thanks to the Minister for his answer. As perhaps a follow-on to points raised in question one by uh, my colleague Mickey Brady, uh, can I ask the Minister, is it not high time now to introduce statutory time limits in youth justice cases? Well, I thank Mr. McElduff for the question. I fear he wasn't necessarily listening to my answers um, when, when I answered question number one, because I have made it clear that the consultation is out on statutory time limits. Time limits, I believe, will underpin the good work being done across the justice system. They could not have been introduced prematurely, but I believe the time is now right, and I will look forward with interest 
to see the responses I get from the various elements who have been consulted. Thank you. And that ends the period for oral questions. We will now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr Mickey Brady. Would the Minister comment on his intervention to change his legislative stipulation uh, on the criteria for appointment of a new Chief Constable? And does the Minister think it appropriate to do so, as he did not discuss this with the Policing Board and tell them that he was doing so? And what are the implications now for his intervention that the, now that the um, First and Deputy First Minister have forced him I to take the duty? One executive. question is sufficient. I'm trying to do my best here. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if the Minister got the end of that, but hopefully he did. <laughs> Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm sure Mr Brady's comments uh, will be picked up by his colleagues if I fail to answer them adequately at this stage. Um, I must, however, first of all correct his suggestion that I did not consult the Policing Board on it. This issue was raised by the Policing Board with me in May of last year. But given the, the significant interest in this issue over the last 24 hours, Principal Deputy Speaker, I hope you'll allow me to take a little longer than I usually take to answer questions to set out my position, because it is important that the issues are properly understood and the debate and comment is informed by the facts. I fear that we've seen a number of public comments reflecting a lack of understanding of both the process and the implications of my decision. The post of Chief Constable is a vital one, and my sole intention has been to ensure that the process for appointing a Chief Constable is governed by fairness, common sense and equality. I have no agenda beyond that. Indeed, my decision gives me, as Minister, less control over the process and gives the Policing Board more control. It might be helpful if I first of all outline my powers in this area, which is set out in Regulation 11 of the PSNI Regulations 2005, that no person shall be appointed as Chief Constable of the Police Service unless he holds or has held such rank in such force and for such period as the Minister shall determine in respect of such an appointment. I have made clear my intention to change the arrangements. A determination by me would issue in accordance with Regulation 46 of the 2005 Regulations. No other legislative process is required, so this decision will not delay the process of appointment. It is also essential to understand the Board's role, indeed the Board's primacy on the appointment of a Chief Constable, enshrined in Section 35 of the Police Northern Ireland Act of, 20, of 2000, which clearly states that the Board shall, subject to the approval of the Minister, appoint the Chief Constable. My intentions are aimed solely at enabling the Board to have more latitude, and I remain entirely respectful of the Board's primacy. Let me summarise how this matter has been dealt with. The criteria for appointment of Chief Constable in England and Wales was amended in 2012 to remove the criterion relating to experience gained outside of the current force. In May 2013, the Policing Board made contact with my department to ask that the matter be raised with me, pointing out concerns about the current arrangements. I was clear in my response that I wished to know what level of support changes might receive from the Board. As required by legislation, to take the issue forward, I launched a wider consultation exercise going beyond the bodies I am required to consult. I consulted the Police Advisory Board Northern Ireland, on which the Policing Board, the Chief Constable and Staff Associations are represented. I also sought the view of the Equality Commission and the views of the Justice Committee. It has become clear from correspondence with the Policing Board and from the Justice Committee appearance that agreed positions have not been reached. It falls to me, therefore, in accordance with my powers and regulations, to reach a view and issue a determination. I announced yesterday my intentions, and I welcome the opportunity to set out now the benefits of those changes. As things stand, and as originally pointed out, it I'm sorry, Principal Deputy Speaker, I understood you'd allowed me longer than I normally take. Thank you. As things stand, and as originally pointed out by the Policing Board in May 2013, it may be anomalous to retain a provision which is no longer applicable in other forces. Specifically, the requirement for two years' service outside Northern Ireland may impact unfairly on certain groups, for example, females or those with dependence or a disability, and the Equality Commission tends to the view that the provision could constitute indirect discrimination. I am keen, therefore, that we remove any such unnecessary barriers to the widest and fairest candidate pool while retaining the power of the Board itself to decide the best criteria. It is not a question of balance. It is perfectly possible, in my view, to achieve both aims simply by removing the current mandatory requirement for service outside Northern Ireland. I am asking the Board to consider outside service to be desirable as a minimum but not essential. It is then entirely open for the Board 
to decide whether that outside service is essential in the forthcoming competition. In summary, my intention is to further empower the Board to define its requirements for Chief Constable. I am aware that there has been some comment to the effect that I have intervened in the middle of a recruitment process. Indeed, Mr Brady made that point. That is not my intention, nor is it the case. The Board is at the very early stage of responding to Matt Baggett's recent decision and announcement. The recruitment process is absolutely not underway. I hope that all involved can at least agree the changes I intend to make, as this will clearly aid the Board in constructing and delivering its own way forward. I am grateful you. for that opportunity. Thank you. And the Speaker's office was contacted that there may, uh, the Minister may have needed some additional time to set out his position, and that was agreed. Uh, Mickey Brady for one supplementary. Thank the Minister for his extensive answer. Um, the Deputy Chief Constable gave the two-year rule as one of the reasons for retiring, and now this announcement came some weeks later. Has the Minister been in touch to apologise? What am I got? Principal Deputy Speaker, I have no reason to apologise to the Deputy Chief Constable for a process which began with correspondence between the Department and the Policing Board in May last year, of which the Deputy Chief Constable was aware, and which, in fact, my changes would enable the current Deputy Chief Constable to be appointed as Chief Constable. I call Mr Dahi Mackay. Order. Order. Minister, there, Minister, there has been <laughs> shock uh, in the towns of Ahahal and Port uh, after a man was convicted uh, of loyalist pipe bomb attacks uh, on a primary school, a community hall uh, and a number of GEA clubs. And that man received only a community service for that. Uh, can I ask the Minister, do you believe this is a suitable deterrent uh, for these kinds of violent sectarian crimes? And do you also agree uh, with the Director of Public Prosecutions uh, that this sentence was unduly lenient? Well, first of all, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm not aware of the specific case that's cited. Secondly, if I was aware of it, it would be inappropriate for me to discuss the decisions of a judge sentencing in a particular case. And thirdly, Mr Mackay has correctly highlighted that the issue of referral for unduly leniency is actually an issue for the Director of Public Prosecutions and not for me, and I think that's where the matter should rest. Mr Mackay, for a supplementary. Gurum, I got a previous last kind of query. I'm not satisfied with that answer. Um, that has been the case before, uh, that cases have been brought here, and you have agreed to review sentence and uh, guidelines on the back of particular cases. So this case deserves uh, some degree of, of attention. So can I ask the Minister as a supplementary, does the Minister uh, agree that there should be a review of sentencing of the case that I have outlined that he is now aware of, uh, and does he recognise that the community, communities affected by this kind of crime believe that this will not deter others from carrying out these sorts of attacks in the future? Well, I can certainly agree with Mr Mackay that there are concerns in the community about attacks such as that, but he has uh, confused the issue of uh, an individual specific sentence in one case with the wider responsibilities that I have to set the sentencing guidelines you know, aided by this assembly through legislation, and that's the fundamental difference where I cannot go into the detail of any individual case. I call Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'm sure the Minister will forgive me for returning to the uh, first question. The Minister is aware that the Office of the First and the Deputy First Minister have now intervened in the affairs of two other Ministers, Environment and Regional Development. Can the Minister of Justice give us an assurance that he's actually in control? Well, I thank Mr Dallet for the question. The issue is, of course, um, related to the powers of First Minister and Deputy First Minister to call in procedures to the full executive and the proportionality of their actions in doing such a thing, what I am absolutely uh, certain of is that my decision was the correct decision, my decision was appropriate, proportional, and has actually not created the difficulties which a number of people who were uh, ill-informed about the circumstances appear to have highlighted. On that basis, I would be very happy to go to the executive meeting on Thursday and explain for the benefit of ministers, as indeed I will be putting in the executive paper over the next day or so, the details of what has been done to explain why it has been appropriate, why it is my role as Justice Minister to carry that out, and to explain that in general to ministers. Okay, Mr Dallet for a supplementary. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for, for, for his answer. Will the Minister, when he goes to the Executive, explain to them in the impassioned way he can that an awful lot has been done to take politics out of police, and now we're back in the quagmire again 
Will he do everything he can to minimise the damage that has been done by this row? Well, I thank Mr Dallard for the point. I certainly have no intention of creating any damage to policing through this row. I did not start this row. I carried out my statutory duties in a way which was entirely appropriate to enhance the role of the board in carrying out its statutory duties. That is an issue which I will be explaining to the executive. I will certainly be doing it. I am not sure whether I do impassioned, as he described it or not. I will be explaining it in as level and straightforward a way as I can, as, as indeed the principal deputy speaker allowed me to do to the House just now. And we will see uh, how other ministers respond when presented with the facts and rather, with, uh, rather than some of the ill-informed comments we have seen recently. I call Mr Phil Flanagan. Can I ask the Minister for his reaction to the recent assessment by a legal representative that up to 50 per cent of the legal costs associated with the RUC hearing loss cases could have potentially been saved if those cases had been dealt with in a more pragmatic fashion and disposed of upon receipt of sufficient medical evidence, rather than the vast majority of them having been contested to the front doors of the court and then settled at huge cost? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, clearly I accept that there has been some concern about the amount which has been paid in legal costs on that. Um, however, it is certainly not the view of the Chief Constable or indeed the Crown Solicitor's Office which advises him and his lawyers uh, that uh, not uh, dealing with it the way they did it in terms of incurring legal expenses would have necessarily resulted in any cheaper solutions. That was the advice that he was given. That is my understanding of how he's carried out, and that is the issue which I have to leave with him. Mr. Flanagan for a supplementary. Guru, may I get a free or less security of the ministers on, on top form avoiding answering questions today? But what, do, does the minister not agree that the public will now believe that the gusto to which he is trying to cut legal aid and family law matters is being pursued is in stark contrast to the gravy train approach, um, which seems to be apparent in relation to the legal costs of those cases that I have mentioned? Well, it's fine for Mr Flanagan to make cheap jibes about avoiding answering questions, but I'm really surprised to hear members of Sinn Féin expecting me to take political views over policing matters. I thought that's what they were opposed to in terms of the policing reforms that have happened in recent years. The reality is I've given the straight answer. It is an issue which falls to the Chief Constable as to how those matters are handled, and I have separate and different distinct responsibilities in terms of managing the legal aid budget, which involve looking at the overall costs of legal aid as part of the overall cost of the justice system, given the difficult economic circumstances we're in. I call Mr Declan McAleer. Following the recent awarding of contracts to provide learning and skills training to prisoners in the north, can the Minister please, please outline the criteria against which success or otherwise of those entered in the contracts will be um, assessed? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I don't have the criteria uh, for the work done by the prison service in terms of their learning and skills contracts before me at the moment. Um, if Mr McAleer wants to write me about any specific aspect of that, I'll be very happy to respond. Thank you, Mr McAleer, for supplementary. Um, uh, Gore Malgar, I want to thank the Minister for his, his answer. Uh, can he give any indication um, of how he intends to ensure appropriate value for, value for money in the delivery of any of those prospective programmes? Well, I can assure Mr McAleer and the House as a whole that those issues uh, were tested by the prison service in terms of how they sought tenders and how they awarded tenders for what are currently short-term contracts. Uh, there is a real issue in terms of managing a number of services within the prison service. Uh, we've all seen uh, the different uh, benefits that uh, prison health care has been outsourced to the South Eastern Trust. By the same process, the learning and skills uh, issue is not something which the prison service has particular expertise and there were clear benefits in outsourcing to those who actually run those kind of projects. That was the basis on which the, the contracts were awarded, and that's the basis on which further longer-term contracts will be awarded later this year. I call Ms Pam Cameron. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I asked the Minister did, if he, um, did, did he not think it was appropriate to bring the significant and controversial issue of the changing of the requirement of the post of the Chief Constable to the Executive, and will he accept the decision of the Executive on this matter? Principal Deputy Speaker, a narrowing of my role to enhance the role of the policing board, making a very modest change from a particular criterion being essential to being de desirable, was not, in my opinion, uh, relevant for referral to the executive. It does not have controversy, except in the minds of some people recently. It has it is, it is not got a cross-cutting issue, and it is a matter which is clearly in statute the responsibility of the Minister of Justice. 
order. Time is up.